Mark Timmons. I'm vice president of sustainability with the American Iron and Steel Institute, uh, AISI. AISI is a, a, an association that represents producers of steel, so the steel mills in the uh, in the United States. And I'm going to be talking today about uh, sustainability as it relates to uh, steel production and specifically steel production uh, here in the U.S. And I'm going to start with a rather complex looking graphic that I'm not going to review in any detail, but I just want to use it to point out that there really are essentially two steel making processes that are somewhat different, uh, not just in the U.S., but uh, pretty much globally. Uh, if you if you look at uh, sort of the outer ring of this uh, of this graphic, it represents the uh, integrated or uh, BOF basic oxygen furnace uh, route of steel making, and that's the one where where iron ore is taken from the ground and converted in a blast furnace to uh, molten iron, and then refined further with uh, some steel scrap input in the furnace to produce different grades of steel. The other process is called the EAF or electric arc furnace process. It also uses the steel scrap, typically a higher percentage of steel scrap. And most often, but not always, some uh, iron input to create really the same uh, steel product. So it's just important as we go through this to understand that uh, steel can be produced by either of these processes. And then once the steel is produced, that the previous, previous graphic kind of demonstrated how the steel is produced from raw material through production. So the first two items on this graphic, but it really just shows that the, uh, the life of steel, the life cycle of steel is a very, it's a very circular uh, life cycle. It's a very circular process. The steel is produced, it's used to create something, some product, uh, a steel beam, a steel car door, a steel can, and then it goes through its use phase, which can be as short as one year. Uh, in the case of some steel can, you know, like a vegetable can or uh, as long as 50 or 100 years for steel buildings and bridges. But the one constant is that at the end of the steel product's life, it can be recycled uh, back into another steel product. And I'll mention some more about the recycling later. So uh, the big picture view of the American steel industry uh, can be summed up in, a, in just a few items. One, it's really one of the, it's the cleanest and most energy efficient of the major steel producing uh, countries in the world. And I'll, I'll show some more information about that in a minute. It's also truly essential. It's vital to uh, the overall effort to kind of decarbonize the American economy. Uh, it's also critical to national security and a lot of discussion recently about infrastructure. Steel is important to nearly every type of infrastructure project. And not inconsequentially, it, it also supports about 2 million uh, jobs here in the US. We at uh, AISI uh, promote this basic messaging with much more specific messaging on, uh, on social media very routinely. These are just some examples of the kinds of messaging that you can see through, through those uh, outlets. But the highlights of the messaging come down to, again, it comes down to the basics. Uh, it's the cleanest of the major steel producing countries. And we like to use this tagline that's, uh, it starts with steel. And what we mean by that is that steel forms the basis of many of the sustainable technologies, especially sustainable energy technologies 
that will be critical to uh, decarbonization over time in the US, whether that's uh, uh, support frames for solar panels or uh, wind towers, which are predominantly steel, and even uh, transmission lines for the electricity that is produced, whether it's by sustainable means or otherwise. And you, uh, you don't have to take our word for that uh, about the uh, steel being vital to all of these technologies. There was a report that was released earlier this year by McKinsey and Company. Uh, you see the title in the upper left, how the metals and mining sector will be at the core of enabling the energy transition. And this rather complex chart on the right, uh, I would just look at the section highlighted in red each of those large black circles represents a material, in this case steel, that is critical for each of the uh, energy technologies uh, listed across the top. And you can see all of the major uh, renewable energy technologies or sustainable energy technologies are listed there. Geothermal, hydro, wind power, solar, even nuclear and, uh, and hydrogen. And what's clear is that Steel is the only metal of all the metals listed. It's the only metal that is listed in this report as being critical to all of the uh, renewable energy technologies that again, will be in turn important to uh, overall decarbonization of the grid. And then uh, of course the economy in general. So the, so the point I'm making here is that not only is steel itself in the process of becoming less uh, uh, CO2 emissions intensive, but it's critical to many of the other technologies that are doing the same in other aspects of the economy. So what is it about American steel versus steel produced in other parts of the world that make it so sustainable? Well. It can get a little technical, but uh, the very first bullet is an important one. And that is that uh, the, the integrated mills in the US use a form of iron called pelletized iron, which is just different. It's, it's just a different way of producing the iron that's used further to uh, produce steel. And this, this form of iron results in lower, uh, lower embodied emissions for the steel that's eventually produced. Uh, another really important aspect of steel produced in the US is that there's a significantly greater use of natural gas instead of coal as an energy source. The US uh, has abundant resources of natural gas, unlike some other parts of the world, and uh, natural gas as an energy source, again, is just a lower CO2 emissions um, source when it comes to producing energy versus coal. Uh, we also have a larger share of electric arc furnace production than other regions of the country. In fact, the chart on the left shows how significant that difference is. In the U.S., about 70 percent of the steel that's produced is produced by electric arc furnace. Uh, in the rest of the world, it's essentially flipped. It's, it's less than 30% that's produced by uh, EAF. And of course, we, uh, we recycle partly because of the high share of EAF production, we recycle a lot of steel scrap into new steel. Typically here in the US, somewhere between 60 and 80 million tons of steel scrap is recycled every year into new uh, steel products. And in this past year, that number was closer to, we don't have the final numbers yet, but it looks like it will be closer to the 80 million uh, number. And we also have a fairly clean and improving uh, electricity grid. And I wanted to say some more about that uh, on this slide. The, uh, this is from the U.S. Uh, Energy Information Administration, EIA, and it shows both the current 
as of 2021 and future projected uh, distribution of fuels used to generate electricity in the US. And the numbers to the left there, 37, 21, 19, 23, those are the numbers as of 2021 for natural gas, renewables, nuclear, and coal. And you can see uh, two things. One is that natural gas at 37% is very high compared to other parts of the world. That's important. But also uh, the trend toward, not surprisingly, toward increased renewables, uh, more than doubling in share between uh, now and 2050. And of course, coal is on a pretty steady decline, although a, a bit of a slower decline uh, in future years, but still declining out until uh, 2050, ending at about 10%. So there was a, a report that was uh, released just uh, about six weeks ago by a consultant, a consulting firm named Global Efficiency Intelligence. Dr. Ali Hazenbegi was a researcher. And this report calculates uh, CO2 emissions intensity of the steel industry in various regions and countries around the world. It's based on 2019 data. And as you can see on the next slide, it really reinforces this uh, message that I mentioned earlier about the uh, US steel production industry being uh, the lowest of the largest steel producing countries. The report itself includes uh, many more countries than what are shown here. These are the nine largest. And it also includes the uh, EU, the European Union, as an aggregate, that's the uh, third bar from the left. Uh, something else worth noting is that the average emissions intensity of steel making in the US is about half of what it is in China and less than half of what it is in uh, India. Another way to look at this is the impact of uh, importing steel from other countries into the US and this chart uses data from that same report to demonstrate that the emissions from direct steel imports, this is in 2021, right about, that's the blue bar, it's right around 40 million tons of CO2 emissions associated with those imports. If that same steel, if those same steel products were produced here in the US, it would have resulted in almost 13 million metric tons of uh, uh, less CO2 emissions. And I know it's hard to picture what 13 million metric tons really means. So the, the box on the right shows some equivalent uh, emissions. That's equivalent to almost 3 million uh, passenger cars driven for one year. So it's, it's a significant amount. And of course the industry isn't stopping there. Uh, there is significant work underway to further reduce the uh, emissions associated with steel making here in the US. I, I won't go through all of these, but uh, one of the very important ones is research into the use of hydrogen as a reduction agent in lieu of either uh, coal or natural gas. The big issue, uh, there's, there's no question that there's a, uh, an important future for hydrogen in uh, iron making, but the biggest problem now, of course, is that the it requires a lot of hydrogen and the hydrogen is just not available yet on that scale. Uh, there's also research going on about uh, capturing the uh, carbon and either storing it or reusing it beneficially somewhere else and, and uh, increased use of renewable energy in the steel making uh, process itself. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about what is really driving all of this. I, you know, I think we know that there are some, some uh, very big picture global drivers for decarbonization. But in the U.S. specifically, what, what is driving all of this? Well, some of it is uh, legislation, especially relative to construction. You may be familiar with something called the Buy Clean California Act, which has now been around 
for several years, several years and is now uh, actually being implemented. Uh, it, it's a program that for projects funded by the state of California requires that steel and other products, some other products, meet uh, limits for uh, embodied greenhouse gas emissions. And several other states are developing similar programs. By Clean Colorado Act is now uh, in place, and that one is going to require EPDs. I'll talk about EPDs in a minute, beginning uh, just uh, in about one month, uh, beginning July 1st. Uh, EPDs will be required for construction products in Colorado. And several other states are considering similar legislation. The federal government is also considering uh, buy clean legislation. They've established a buy clean task force to examine and come up with recommendations. And we don't know the exact timing on that, but I'm expecting that we'll see some initial recommendations from that work fairly soon. The other thing that's driving it is, uh, is designers, uh, engineers and architects in, in buildings and bridges, at least uh, not many architects and bridges, but uh, engineers, two groups, the Structural Engineering Institute and the, uh, America, uh, the American Institute of Architects is, uh, they have programs in place which have committed them to so-called net zero embodied emissions for uh, buildings. And you can see, at least in the case of the AIA, they mentioned specifically infrastructure. Uh, there's no question that these kinds of uh, requirements are gonna make their way into the bridge world uh, very soon. So I mentioned EPDs, environmental product declarations. Uh, just real quickly, uh, it's important to know what EPDs are because this is the way that all of this is typically measured, at least at the product level. Um, and you can see the first two bullets here show two different definitions. There's not a standard definition for an EPD, but it really is a document that communicates the environmental performance of a product or material. And there are some uh, guidelines for how those are put together and to make sure that they're consistent, that they're showing consistent information. And uh, the EPDs, importantly, can be either industry-wide, so it can be, for instance, uh, for structural steel beams as a whole, on average, in the US, or it can be from a specific facility that man manufactures that same product. This is a comparison that's often used. Often, uh, the EPD is compared to the nutrition label on foods. Uh, it's a pretty simplistic comparison, but the basic concept is right. It talks about how much of the product we're talking about and what are the potential impacts associated with that amount of product. This one happens to be for concrete. But an, an example of a, of a very relevant steel EPD is this one from the American Institute of Steel Construction, AISC, and it's for a steel plate, fabricated steel plate, as would be uh, used in bridges, for instance. Okay, I wanna, I wanna mention a little bit about recycling because recycling is kind of the less glamorous aspect of uh, steel sustainability, but it's also a really important one because steel truly is the most recycled material on the planet. Uh, and a steel beam, I'm not sure that everyone understands this, but a steel beam can become another steel beam or it can become any other steel product. It can become a refrigerator or a car door or a roof panel. I already mentioned the amount of steel scrap that's typically recycled in the US every year, but over the last 30 years, over 1 billion tons of steel have been recycled. And that's, uh, that's just in the United States. Steel products have varying levels of recycled content. Uh, some steel construction products like structural sections and rebar though are typically produced from very high levels of recycled content, uh, often over 90% and 
and sometimes close to 100% recycled uh, scrap. We did a study a couple of years ago on the, uh, the average steel recycling rate here in the US. And uh, this graph shows the results of that study. Uh, it shows two lines, one's a three year rolling average, one's a 10 year rolling average uh, recycling, rate, recycling rate overall for steel. Uh, the reason we use rolling averages is simply that the, uh, the numbers vary year to year, and it's not really uh, indicative of you know, any actual steel making conditions so much. So uh, we found that uh, I think the three year rolling average it provides a really good indication. And you can see that the, the last year for which we have data from this study was 2019 and the three year average rate in 2019 was just under 70%. Well, if you look at the 10-year uh, rolling average rate, it, it has very, very little. Uh, it's between 71 and 75% for, uh, for the last uh, 10 years or more. That's an overall average recycling rate. It's important to point out, though, that each sector has a, in some cases, very different recycling rate. And some of them, like heavy structural sections used in construction, are recycled at very high rates. Rebar is somewhat lower, of course, because it's just more difficult uh, to do so. Uh, construction in general is one of the uh, higher rates uh, at just under 75 percent. And you might ask, well, why isn't it even higher than that? There are a lot of reasons. I won't go into a lot of detail now, but there are a lot of reasons. There's some uh, some steel material uh, is buried and it's, you know, it's just stays in the ground. It isn't, it isn't dug up. Some is just doesn't make its way to, to a recycling facility. There are a lot of reasons, but that's a very high rate. And uh, you can see in some of the other categories, something like steel containers or cans, very subject to consumer behavior. That is whether the consumer actually recycles them is right around uh, 62%. So I'm going to summarize with a few points. Uh, the industry, as I've said many times, leads the world in terms of low carbon emissions intensity steel production. We're very proud of that. Uh, the steel industry also though continues uh, projects to reduce further its greenhouse gas intensity. Uh, bridges, design and construction of bridges will has started to be and will undoubtedly be affected by these types of initiatives in the near future. Uh, embodied uh, GHG emissions intensity or CO2 emissions intensity is really the metric that's used most often when evaluating uh, any product or material. And the EPDs, Environmental Product Declarations for Steel Bridge Components and possibly eventually steel bridges themselves on an, either an industry average or facility specific basis will also undoubtedly eventually be needed to demonstrate compliance with all of these programs. Uh, just two more quick notes. One is that the data for all of this comes from something called life, life cycle inventory data. Uh, we have that data, we AISI has that data for products like hot roll coil, cold roll coil, et cetera, listed here, plate structural sections. We're now in the process of collecting and publishing new data based on 2021. And those results will be expected early next year. And uh, a quick plug for our uh, uh, website, seal.org. There's a lot of good sustainability related uh, information on that site and documents that can be useful in subjects like construction and recycling, steel making, et cetera. And with that, I will conclude and um...